we are going to specifically talk about light microscopy. There can be very many different kinds of microscopy. But, uh, today we will focus primarily on light microscopy because that's uh, by far the most standard kind of. When you say microscopy, that's what you think of. So, and how people have been uh, pushing this technology further and further. So, uh, I'm finding it difficult to handle both of these at the same time. Let's try. So. So I, this morning I was doing a Google search for a scientist. You see, I've been fair. I did not enter biologist. I just entered the word scientist into Google and I did a uh, Google search. And what do, what do you see? Primarily, if you say you're an alien being, you're saying doing a Google search and trying to learn about culture of Earth. You'd say, what? Who is a scientist? A scientist is definitely someone who wears a lab coat. White lab coat is essential. Sometimes they shake because of things. Look, there are people shaking because of things. But there are three or four of them. But at least five of them are appearing through a microscope. So you see, so somehow, I am not saying all science is microscopy, certainly not. But in popular culture, if you say, who is a scientist? A scientist is probably a biologist peering through a microscope. So, so they, of course, of course, there are physicists and chemists, and um, and while uh, physics, in a way, is more glamorous and chemistry is more useful, biology is certainly the thing to do today. Which is like, when again, this is it's, you can see I did not cheat at all. I just entered scientist and I did a Google search, and this is what came up. So, so somehow there is a veneration for light microscopy. So, because seeing is, of course, we have the old adage, seeing is believing, seeing with your own eyes. Even seeing with x-rays is seeing, but the thing is seeing with your own eyes is the most of believing. So, which is why perhaps this, we have the, when we will see that what we see is a very, very, very narrow range of the, uh, of electromagnetic spectrum, right? So, electromagnetic spectrum can span, span such a wide range of wavelengths, but uh, despite that, because we see in the visible range, which is why it's visible, we have a particular obsession with this visible range and with light microscopy. So, but uh, generally, we will soon see this, that the resolution of light microscopes are only that much good. What's the typical size of a protein, shall we say? Say something. Angstrom is too small, so it's say in nanometers, right? Yeah. So, where is, uh, and what is the wavelength of light, visible range? We know that, right? So what is the visible range of light? So, 400 to 700 nanometers, right? So, substantially larger than that. And our resolution is somehow comparable to this wavelength of light, about half that wavelength of visible light. So, shall we say the best resolution that we can get up till now, from a light microscope, has been something of the order of 200 nanometers, shall we say. Whereas your typical protein is 5 nanometers, much, much smaller than that. Obviously, electron micro, you would say, yes, we have heard of electron microscopes. Those obviously can do better. They can give you down to nanometer scale resolution. So why do we obsess about light microscopes at all? So we would say there are advantages of using light microscopes. You can observe things in living cells. It's given to fewer artifacts. Okay. So ultimately, why then this limit of resolution of light microscopes? It's because when you have diffraction through a circular aperture, you will have something called a series of fringes like this. When you have circular aperture, this would be a two-dimensional Gaussian. This is called a near disk. You have a central maximum. The size of this central maximum is set by, as you can see, 0.61. This we will keep coming back to, so which I have written it here. Which is right. Don't, if you take anything, even if you forget everything about the super resolution techniques, one thing that you should remember, the resolution of the light microscope is given by this equation. 0.61 lambda by the numerical aperture of the lens. What is the numerical aperture of the lens? We'll say it's something n sine theta, what that is. We'll define soon enough. Ultimately, what is the problem? The problem is to distinguish two very small objects which are very close to each other, right? So how close can they be? 
before you stop distinguishing them as distinct objects of consumption. Any point object, we said because of this phenomenon of diffraction, what is diffraction? The diffraction is uh, bending of light around the edges of an object. When the, when the size of the aperture is becoming in the order of the wavelength of light, then you will start to see fringes like this. So this you can, this is actually very everyday. You can, yeah, you can try to look through this gap, through these two fingers. You'll see, or not on this string, but if you look outside, you will see, start seeing some lines. Okay? So there is a certain amount, those lines are, of course, this is not a monochromatic source. This is a white light that has all colors. But there, this is a part of this is because of diffraction. Okay? So basically, the point is that you might have a very tiny object. You have a 20 nanometer protein, which is fluorescently, which is emitting some light. Okay? But because of diffraction, you will see it as a 200 to 50 nanometer object. So, this is the fundamental problem of light microscopy that you cannot resolve below a certain limit given by this equation 0.61 lambda by the molecular aperture of a lens. So, about lambda by 2, shall we say. Okay? So, the numerical aperture of a lens, if it's for arguments sake, if we say, let's keep it. Uh, to something like 1.22, you can see then it, that would be lambda by 2. And if you say the visible light, the, the, the shortest visible light that I can use is probably something like 400 nanometers, then you get something lambda by 2. You can plug in the numbers here by yourself, and you'll see that this resolution of the light microscope is coming to be something like 200 nanometers. Right? This we understand. And uh, if two objects are very close to each other, if then beyond the point, the, the Lord Raleigh defined the point where the minimum of the first minimum of this object coincides with the central maximum of that object. Let us not worry about that. Point is that when two point objects are very close to each other, then we are not able to resolve them. So here you can see these are some images of beads. Here you can see it, maybe these are some refractory, some different meaning. Um, very small bits, 20 nanometer bits, and uh, you can see it is formed if you look at the full width that half matters, say the profile of this gauge, you will get a something like 250 nanometer spot here. Here they are clearly separated, you can distinguish them. But once they come start coming closer and closer to each other, then it becomes harder and harder to distinguish them. Right? So then that is our problem. The protein molecules that we want to look at are typically in the order of uh, 20 nanometers, whereas the resolution of our light microscope is at best something like 200 nanometers, which is 0.2 microns. So, so what uh, when we when we our eyes can't resolve something, what we do is that we we'll use this. Um, we would use lenses to magnify and to increase the resolution, right? So this is, say, a simple magnifying glass, and that's a compound microscope. And using systems like this, a long time back, 17th century, Robert uh, Hooke could see the first plant cells. So you can see the scale bar here is 100 micron, and your typical cell then is in tens of microns, shall we say. So this you can resolve. But if you have to look inside one of these cells and see subcellular structure, you would not have been able to do that in the 17th century. And so now you can. Now that our lenses have gotten better and uh, and uh, when we have been able to look at closer and closer at these cells like these. But still, there is a fundamental limit imposed by diffraction which says that how much how, how close can two objects be before you stop resolving them? And that was worked out by Aaron Stabbing in the 19th century. Now, so from the 17th century, we have moved to the 19th century. And this is that equation, a form of this equation that I was telling you about. And this is on Abbey's gravestone also. So, so this is such a fundamental con contribution that he put it on his gravestone. And, uh, and that D, this resolving power, is lambda, the wavelength of the light, by 2 n sine alpha. So if you say that n sine alpha, n being the refractive index of the medium, and alpha being this half angle of the, when you say you have a parallel beam of light incident on a lens, it's focusing to a spot. 
for focusing to a point. Is it really a point? It's not a point. It has some physical dimensions. The physical dimensions of that spot is of this order. It's, it's lambda by 2 and sine alpha. And uh, this alpha is the half angle that, that this cone of light is making, right? So this way, meaning this is very, very relatively simple, right? You really don't need to know physics or in if you just plug in the numbers, shall we say, we shall we put lambda equal to 400 nanometer and in let's put 1 for air and sine alpha, what's the maximum value that sine alpha can take? 1, right? at most 1, chances are lesser than that, right? So even if we are very, very optimistic and though that's not reasonable that if we put sine alpha equal to 1, we will be just left with lambda by 2, right? And what is lambda by 2? Well, lambda is 400 nanometers, then lambda by 2 is 200 nanometers. Right? So this was then the sort of, they said, oh, this limit is imposed by physics. This is inviolate. We cannot, whenever with light microscopy, we'll be able to do better than this. So that was the thought. And that was the thought for the next uh, 100 uh, or so years. right? So. But despite that, the lenses got better and better, and so you could push the resolution down to that 200 to 50 nanometer limit. And here are some the human skin cells, looks nice. Here's some uh, keratin marked in yellow, and the nucleus with the D marked in blue. Okay. So, and this typically the size of this nucleus would be, shall we say, 10 20 microns, and the whole cell is 30 40 microns, shall we say. On the other hand, the electron microscope e has been pushing resolution to far, far greater lengths, far, far smaller lengths than light microscopes could ever achieve. You can get nanometer scale resolution, but there are two or three major limitations of electron microscopy. Electrons have much shorter wavelengths. Because they have shorter wavelengths, you can resolve more. And so what is the wavelength of an electron? And so that you will get from uh, that lambda equal to Planck's constant by the momentum, right? But, but be that as it may, let us let us just take this for assume that electrons have much shorter wavelengths, but A, there will be artifacts of preparation. You will have to prepare the, dehydrate the cells, slice them in a certain way, which can produce artifacts. And B, you cannot investigate dynamics in a life cell. It's necessarily, you have to kill the cell, you have to fix the cell, and, and then only can you look at, uh, look at, uh, uh, look at them and at what you will do is at best get a snapshot in time. You really cannot get the time course or dynamics of a cell with the electron microscopy which you can do with light microscopy despite the worst resolution. I will show you an instance of what I mean by that and generally in Sawal Jawabs we tend to emphasize the why should one, why should the public care about this but I, for microscopy, it's hard to do because almost any kind of biology, any disease you think of, our understanding of that, our fundamental understanding of that has come from light microscopy. And so take your fa favorite disease is a strange thing, but the, well, let's not say favorite disease. Take any disease. And so at the molecular level, what is happening? And so if you say cancer, that's because of DNA damage, right? So how do we know more about that? That we will know by imaging the cells, right? With light microscopy. So, so it doesn't be here. I don't have to motivate it with one particular disease. You take any human disease, the molecular understanding of that will require microscopy, and oftentimes light microscopy. It will require other. It will require biochemistry. It will require molecular biology also. But as we said, seeing there's nothing like seeing with one's own eyes, right? So, for instance, here is a, say, what do I mean by dynamics? I'll show you one example here. Neutrophils are white cells that hunt and kill bacteria. In the spread, as neutrophils are killed, they seen in the midst of red blood cells. Staphylococcus aureus bacteria have been added. The small clump of bacteria release a chemoattractant that is sensed by the neutrophil. The neutrophil becomes polarized and starts chasing the bacteria. The bacteria, bounced around by thermal energy, move in a random path, seeming to avoid their predator. Eventually, the neutrophil catches up with the bacteria and engulfs them by phagocytosis. <laughs> So 
So, we tend to have a little bit of an anthropocentric view of life. Right? So, neutrophils don't work, so don't take the sound too seriously. <laughs> so they do, it's not like they eat bacteria and then they bore. <laughs> But uh, but also the other thing why this is anthropocentric is that it almost seemed like that neutrophil, which is a white blood cell, which is one of our immune cells, in a, among a pool of red blood cells, it's chasing the bacteria. It almost seemed like a sentient being, right? It's like it knows what it is chasing, or can, then it's going after the bacteria is running away, the, the neutrophil is chasing after that. So, but of course the cell does not have a brain like we do and we have more complex organisms but the thing is this is said by the, there is some chemo attractant that the bacteria is secreting and the water, there is some cell biology happening within the neutrophil and what basically is happening is actin is depolymerizing at the far away edge and actin is a cytoskeleton it's one of the skeletal proteins of that cell and it's polymerizing in the front edge and so it's effectively it can chase the bacteria so but it's not like it is taking a decision there is no brain here so there is, but in, in effect it almost looks like a sentient thing okay and it, it, you see and this is how this is in a spread of blood that we and with the white light microscope that we saw this okay? but this is I mean in our bodies also neutrophils are chasing bacteria neutrophils are clearing bacteria when they are failing to do so that's when you have some kind of a disease right so and so and this kind of dynamics is not conceivable with electron microscopy, which is why light microscopy is still interesting. So here, because light microscopy makes for some pretty pictures, so what the neutrophil and red blood cell picture we saw was primarily just white light being transmitted to the sample and then we are creating contrast somehow, working between, usually cells are very transparent, but there are methods you can use to create contrast, and you can take movies like that. The other method that people use well, very often is fluorescence. Fluorescence might be so. Here, for instance, if I say these are uh, newborn rat cochlea, right, and the neurons are in red and the ciliary processes are in green, or when I say this is a skin cell, the DNA, the nucleus where the DNA is in blue and the keratin filaments are in yellow. And so that means that I have somehow marked them with different colors which is allowing me to, on a microscope, to image them like, like, like so. Mm -hmm. So, and how are you mark them with different colors is with fluorescence. So, do we know what fluorescence is? Do we do, some of us know, some of us know, and some of us perhaps don't. And so, basically let's go back to the basics and just learn a little bit of fluorescence. Okay. So, so we'll start again a long time back. John Frederick William Herschel, uh, writing the philosophical translation of the Royal Society of London, writes: "The sulphate of quinine, you know, the magnesium drug, is well known to be extremely sparingly soluble in water. It is, however, easily and copiously soluble in tartaric acid." Equal weights of the sulfur and the crystallized tartaric acid rubbed up together with the addition of very little water dissolve entirely and immediately. That's fine. Now, something. It is this solution, largely diluted, which exhibits the optical phenomenon in question. Though perfectly transparent and colorless when held between the eye and the light or a white object, it yet exhibits in certain aspects and after certain incidences of the light an extremely vivid and beautiful celestial blue color. So, uh, there was a time when you could write signs like this, celestial blue color. We, we tend to be more prosaic in our text these days, but the thing is, this was in the 19th century. So, uh, where, how does the, where does the term fluorescence come from? In his 1852 paper on refrangibility, George Gabriel Stokes described the ability of fluorospar and uranium glass to change invisible light beyond the violet end of the visible spectrum to blue light, from violet to blue. You can see it's becoming Violet to blue is what? A little longer in length, right? We'll soon see that. He named this phenomenon fluorescence. I am almost inclined to coin a word and call the appearance fluorescence from fluor spark, that is fluorite, as the analogous term opalescence is derived from the name of a mineral. Yeah. So it came from the name, the name comes from the name of this mineral. But the point is that when you look at this under UV light, we generally cannot see UV light, it emits blue, right? So then, the basically then fluorescence is this, the outer 
depending on the kind of molecule you are, your outward electrons can be excited to uh, excited for a single state. From there, when they will lose some energy, and they can, we'll soon look at that. Uh, as they will lose some energy as heat, and then they will come back to the ground state. In the process, they will emit a photon, which is of longer wavelength. How do we understand that it's of longer wavelength? For that, I've written this: the only other equation we'll need. Energy of a photon is h. We know Planck's constant. You knew nu is the frequency. That's h into the speed of light by the wavelength, right? So higher the wavelength, lower the energy, right? So so when you're losing some energy, and we will see soon see when you're losing some energy, where, where and then the emission that you will have will be of a longer wavelength. You excite with UV, you emit in blue. You excite with blue, you emit in green. You excite with green, you emit in orange. So on and so forth. And then you can, uh, and then you can use that. So we will. Uh, uh, so this is the, this is what we were saying before that. The look, this is the entire electromagnetic spectrum. Here, really, really long wave, radio waves, short wave waves, microwaves, infrared. This is your visible, visible range, 400 to 500, so, so, sorry, 400 to 700 nanometers wavelength also. Then your ultraviolet, X-rays, gamma rays as you go shorter and shorter in wavelength. Right? So you see, when it, of this whole range of electromagnetic radiation, visible light spans only this little bit. But we are interested in that because that is what we can see. Okay, so, and it's, uh, and uh, so this is it, right? 380 to 750 nanometers or so. So here, violet, this we have learned in school, the right? Violet, blue, green, yellow, orange, red. So, violet, indigo, if you will, with gear. Here, which you see, these guys, because they have shorter wavelengths, they have higher frequency. If you put it in this equation, you will see UV photons will have higher energy than, say, red photons. Right? So, so, and we, we saw that when we floor spar, when it was excited with the UV, it emitted in blue. With you, similarly, you can have something that is emitted, excited in blue, can emit in green. So, this then is the process. Okay, what is this? Uh, where is this coming from? This is what we were saying that the outer electrons are being excited from a ground state to an <coughs> excited singlet state, and here they are losing some energy. Among this, you see there is this thing small. This is called the Jablonski energy diagram. We don't need to worry too much about it, except to say that you are losing some energy here in coming down from this vibrational energy state. And then from this state, when you're coming back down to electron is coming back down to the ground state, it will emit a photon. And that photon, because you've lost some energy here, will be of a lower energy. If it's of a lower energy, that from this e equal to hc by lambda, you can see it will necessarily be of a higher wavelength. Right? This is the process of fluorescence. And then you can have a, a excitation profile like this. You will excite here instead of wave uh, length, wave number is not that's just the inverse of the wavelength. And you can have an excitation profile, this is the say in blue, and the emission profile in in the show in red. So but the, all this is very good, but the thing is um, you really don't get a feel of it until you see something. Brother, hold on. Hold on. So here I got some so solution of fluorescing. So this is, and I don't have it. This would, uh, I will show. So, so normally this would be excited in blue, and it's say it shall be it's excited around 488 nanometer, which is blue, and it's about 520 nanometer, which is green. I don't have a blue filter with me. I'm using my phone's flashlight. And when I hold this, but this has blue in it. Among other colors, this also has blue in it. So when I bring this, can you see some green here? Can you, can you, can you? Yes, yes, yes. So basically, this is the, the blue light from my white light of my LED of my phone. When I'm exciting this fluorescent, 
and when this if these electrons in these fluorescent molecules are coming back to their ground state, they're emitting green photons, which you are seeing, right? So, on the other hand, I have another transparent fluking solution with a slight pinkish tinge, and this is something called rhodium in B. Now, do you some, see some orange color? Very, yeah? yeah, from the back, orange color, yeah? yeah. So, this is this, in fact, this is excited in green and emits in orange also. So this is rhodomine B. See some orange color where the light is coming through the solution? Orange-ish. I think the green is easier. Let's look at it. It's a green, definitely green. Solution looks a bit transparent. I shine white light through it and you see, instead of a celestial blue, I'm showing a celestial green. So, so uh, this then is fluorescence. Thank you. So, uh, all this is detailed. Point is electrons are going to excited single states and when they're coming back, they are emitting photons of a longer wavelength, which you are seeing as that color green or orange or what have you. Now think that if you could attach, so yeah, I have fluorescent there in that picker and rhodomin B in that picker. If I could attach these two different structures in the cell, chances are I will be able to see them as distinct, distinct entities, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, where is my thing that? Oh. Right. So this, uh, this, uh, yeah, they are rich in aromatic links. We will soon talk about two chemistry Nobel prizes. So we have to motivate why the, why this is chemistry. So uh, chromophores, whether they are not any ties or they are uh, encoded as proteins, they are frequently rich in aromatic links. Uh, they are the chromophores are the components of molecules which absorb the light. So and. Just to be different to the entire electromagnetic spectrum, we have put here is a uh, cable with a lot of numbers. But the main point, uh, main point is this: that this is your visible light, which is about uh, in this case it's about 800 nanometers or so, with an energy of about in the order of an electron volt. Whereas uh, here at the size of the quanta, quanta is the energy of in each individual photon, right? That's here, here you can see for gamma rays it's 1.2 into 10 to the power 6 electron volts, right? We, we will not, in electron volts is a unit of energy. So we don't worry about the, the, have to worry about the definition of an electron volt. Just see that gamma rays, while it's a million electron volts for visible light, it's about 1.6 electron volts. So it's, so the, so the, a individual photon of a gamma ray has million times more energy than an individual photon of visible light. Mm -hmm. So then you can see, as you go longer in wavelength, the, this also comes down quite a bit. The individual in radio waves it will be a very, very little amounts of energy. So, but this is what we are concerning ourselves with now. So, uh, and this is then, this is what we said, right? We, we can have, we can have a light source, white light source, like my phone's LED, maybe a little better LEDs than that, then I can put a blue glass in front of that, I will get only blue light, I can shine it on my fluorescent solution, it will emit green, which I can detect through my emission filter. So that's your basic light microscope, right? And with that, then you can, you can do, like here, the DNA in a cell is marked with GAPI, which is a DNA binding dye. It's excited at about, shall we say, 360 nanometer, and it's about 420 or so nanometers, so which is where you're seeing it blue. Here's uh, the cytoskeletal structure called actin. So when we said, when the neutrophil was moving, it was actin, which was polymerizing and depolymerizing differentially at the two ends of the cell, right? And that is marked with something called phalloidin, marked with ATO488, which is a, which is a, as the name implies, it's excited by 488 nanometers, and it's at about 510 nanometers or so. So it's excited in blue, and it's in green. And this is a particular histone protein marked with an antibody 
which has been detected with another antibody, and this in this case the antibody is marked with say uh, antics of 568. Okay. So, or which or which will be excited at 568 nanometer and which will which is greenish orangeish and and it emits at about uh, uh, 580 nanometers so it emits in orange which is like, these colors are false I could make this pink if you want but the thing is actually these are to so the point that I'm trying to make is that by tagging different components in a cell with different fluorophores. We can image them separately. This is the cell nucleus. With the, this is where the DNA is, where the genetic material is. This is the actin cytoskeleton, which is giving structural integrity to the cell, contract integrity to the cell. This is the histone protein, which is important for DNA damage responses, shall we say. Clearly, this cell has lower amounts of gamma H2X than this cell. So you can get cell to cell heterogeneity out. So the point that one is making is that by tagging different components of a cell with different fluorophores, you can image them separately and get very exquisite detail out and know what what uh, protein molecule is in which part of the cell. Right. So by the 1990s, then they here we were here. So that that we we have again these are fixed cells. Okay? These are not living cells. These are fixed cells. They have been killed. They have been fixed in paraformal dehyde and they have stained for different components of the cell. The railroad tracks of the cell, which are the microtubules are in green. The red here shows the actin, actin stress fibers. The blue again shows the nuclei. So, so, so this is nice. This looks, this makes for pretty images. But then what is missing? So, still, we scientists, we scientists are never happy. You would like to make this better. I mean, it's not just about getting pretty images, but actually getting biological insight from this. So, so we have to from here then. Right? So the, we can ask two questions. Can we measure that cell, as we said, was fixed, right? So there is no dynamics there. It, those cells can move around like the neutrophil was moving around. Right? And so here, can we, and not just image the whole cell, but can we see individual proteins moving around in cells? That's one question that we can ask, right? And the other question, that, which has been a bit unsatisfying from the very start, is that the resolution is 200 nanometers. And electron microscopists are telling you we can get resolutions up to down to a nanometer, right? So can we push this limit of resolution? So then these are our two challenges that we will talk about today. And then this will result in the GFP technology. This will take, uh, result in the super resolution methods. And those, once you have worked those out, you get prizes. So this is the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in the year 2008, and this is the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in the year 2014. Mm -hmm. So, so you will see that these are not hard to appreciate why these problems are important and why relatively soon after their discovery, that the Nobel Prizes in Chemistry were awarded for them. And the other thing to note is that these are Nobel Prizes in chemistry. Okay. So you see that this is driven by physics, the phenomenon is physics, the dyes are chemistry, and the applications are in biology. Okay. So in, in that sense, really, it's a similar So both of these have revolutionized, the field that has revolutionized most is biology. Okay. So, so in the truest sense that science is interdisciplinary. Okay. There is no I mean, physics, chemistry, or biology. Incidentally, these are Nobel Prizes in chemistry because the dye chemistry or the nature of the fluorophores and the fluorescent protein was important. They were important problems in chemistry, but ultimately they are used in in physics, in biology, in chemistry, in water theory. So, so let us talk of the first thing then. So the first, the first thing is then the GFP technology. What is GFP? GFP is green fluorescent protein, right? Many of us know this. So we will, and why, 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 what is the, what is the wonderful thing about GFP technologies? We said that with this, we will be able to measure dynamics, right? Right? So here I have shown you a static image of cells. Looks pretty, but you really don't know what, what this, Microtubules are doing, for instance, inside the cell. And we will first see two instances of why GFP technology can be revolutionary, and then we will see how it 
concept of thread. So here, like EV one is thirteen lines to the GTP tubular cap at the growing ends of microtubules. Cells expressing a GFP EV one fusion protein reveal the spectacular dynamics of the microtubule substrata. Note that many, but not all, microtubules in the cell grow from the centrosome. Only the ends of growing microtubules are visible in this experiment. Those that are static or shrinking have lost to their GTP tubulin caps and do not bind EV1. In contrast, when all microtubules are labeled with GFP tubulin, the true extent of the microtubule subskeleton emerges. Both growing and shrinking microtubules can be observed. labeled membrane proteins start their journey to the plasma membrane after synthesis in the endoplasmic reticulum. They are first dispersed throughout the extensive membrane network of the endoplasmic reticulum, from where they move to exit sites that form in random locations in the membrane network. At each of these sites, the membrane proteins are concentrated and packaged into transport vesicles. Clusters of the transport vesicles fuse to form transport intermediates. At the next stage, transport intermediates move the microtubule tracks to the Golgi apparatus near the center of the cell. The membrane proteins exit the Golgi apparatus. They move in transport vesicles that are now pulled outward on microtubules, which deliver them to the plasma membrane. Each time a Golgi-derived vesicle fuses with the plasma membrane, its content proteins disperse. biologists or scientists they will call that but you can readily see this is the difference the difference between the first pretty picture of microtubules that I showed you and then the movie of microtubules that I showed you is the difference between seeing the poster of a movie and seeing the movie itself right so that it's that much of a difference so you imagine if we were just up till 1990s we were looking just at static pictures of microtubules okay they're structural elements of the cell but actually that there is so much dynamics in the cell the microtubules are growing pushes pushing against the plasma membrane retracting the 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 we don't have to worry about what endoplasmic reticulum and golgi are but it is remarkable to see the transport of these proteins from the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi and from there being secreted out into the in the to the extracellular space, right? And all of this is happening within our bodies as we sit here, right? And and that is that is fabulous. So I mean, we will see what GFP technology is, but the thing is this then you can readily appreciate this then is the, the difference between looking at a static picture of a cell and looking at dynamics of definite proteins within the cell. And, so, and this is something that light microscopy can do for you, which electron microscopy even today can. Electron microscopy can give you just static pictures. Very highly resolved pictures, but static pictures, which are prone to artifacts and so So, so then, which is why this is so important, and which is why you are know, Nobel Prize for it. So, Osamu Shimomura was first isolated the GFP from the jellyfish. It was it was a protein. So GFP as the name, let us again say, what is GFP? Green fluorescent protein. And so how is it different from that? Um, so you see reflection, reflection fields. But okay, how is it different from that uh, fluorescein in that beaker there? That is an inorganic dye. This is a protein. Because this is a protein, you can tag any protein of your interest with this and then observe the dynamics of that in living cells. Okay. So, and it was first isolated, yes, from nature, from a jellyfish, Aquaria Victoria, which is in northwest Pacific. And then 
Martin Selfie demonstrated the value of JFP that you can, you know, this is not just good for the jellyfish, but you can actually take this protein and you can express it in human cells, in mouse cells, in whole mice, in drosophila, in say whatever organism that you want, and you can tag any protein, almost any protein of your interest. As so as long as you make sure that the protein fusion protein is functional, you're good to do. And then Roger Sane generally expanded our color. JFP is one color, right? Excited in, shall we say, white JFP is actually excited in UV emits in green, but the normal JFP is say, excites in blue emits in green. Uh, but now he expanded that palette of colors. So you have green, yellow, orange, red, different colors of fluorescent proteins, and you can tag different components of the cell simultaneously. And so and that is very powerful. So this is what we were talking about. We have taken this, this GFP protein. Here are three mice which are expressing this GFP. And here are three mice which are not expressing this CFP. You have illuminated them with UV light. And you can clearly see that these three mice are glowing green, right? So objective is not to make green mice. Objective is to get fusion proteins of they take our protein of interest, fuse it with CFP, and then as you saw in that movie of the EB1 or the movie of the microtubules, to actually see dynamics in cells so to see perhaps localization in the organism, right? And then as we were saying, GFP was just the first one. Now we have BFP, CFP, GFP, YFP, MRFP. BFP is blue fluorescent protein, cyan fluorescent protein, green fluorescent protein, yellow fluorescent protein, MRFP, monomeric red fluorescent protein. So, and, uh, and their excitation spectrum, they, this is, these are the peaks where they're excited at, and this is where they're emitted, and so, right? And this, as we said, so this um, one person who did not, Nobel Prizes are always given to at most three people. Right? And so one person who did not get into the summer called Douglas Crasher, but he was the first one to clone the GFP gene at Woods Hole. Woods Hole is a, is a marine biological laboratory at Woods Hole, which is it's in Cape Cod in Massachusetts. So in the summers in Massachusetts, oftentimes if you go to the beach, you have this beautiful waves, jellyfish coming in waves, and the jellyfish are, they glow blue or they glow green. But this is bioluminescence, but the thing is, there is a protein which is producing blue light in this jellyfish, and then there is also the green fluorescent protein, which are harvesting the blue light and emitting green light. And so, but these are actually jellyfish which you can see relatively commonly, and they glow, they glow in the dark. That really looks beautiful. Right? And so, JP is excited by the light from the photoprotein acuity, which emits the blue light, in the jellyfish acuity of it. And so, you can see in the dark, if you see this jellyfish in the depths of the ocean, because blue light penetrates the deepest in the ocean, and you can see this green emitting jellyfish. And this is the structure of the protein. At the, at the heart of it, there are again those aromatic rings, which are really give rise to the fluorescence. So, and why is this different from that solution of fluorescence? Is because that's again an inorganic diet. This is a protein. What does it mean if it's a protein? It means that you can genetically encode it, right? So, what does it mean to genetically encode something? Do, do we know how 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 the genetic code works? Like when we say the DNA is our genetic code, what does that mean? That, so basically, that, that is the central dogma of molecular biology. So DNA will be read by a machine called RNA polymerase to make something called a messenger RNA. That messenger RNA will be read by something called a ribosome to make a polypeptide chain which will fold into a functional code. So, so these, each we have some, we humans have some 20,000 of this protein coding genes. And then there are uh, but more number of proteins, but that's because of the detail. But ultimately, the point is that with the, you can have a fragment of DNA which codes for this protein, the GFP, right? And then you can take that fragment of DNA and add it to any DNA of your interest, any other protein of your interest, 
and you can make a fusion protein and you can look at dynamics in living cells and so which is exciting right and so this was uh, dr crasher to own the chain martin chalfi for the first time uh, used it and so a complementary dna for the theory of victoria green fluorescent protein produces a fluorescent product when expressed in prokaryotic or eukaryotic cells because exogenous substrates and cofactors are not required for this process gfa expression can be used to monitor gene expression and protein localization in living organisms so and you see he was at the most so institute to work so this special was and then uh, here though this protein came from the jellyfish you can express it in bacteria is it in bacteria or not in bacteria or in a round worm this is a c elegans so it's a nematode so a living nematode which we are really expressing this green fluorescent protein and it is glowing green like the fluorescent in that beaker because this fluorescent because the additional gene products from the jellyfish Chromophore formation is not species specific, and of course, either through the eukaryotic cellular components or by autophagy. Basically, what this means is that you can use it in any organism of your choice. You can use it in mice, not in humans, but in humans. In principle, you can do it in humans. And then the palette of colors have been widened. This white PDFP, brighter JFP, CFP, so on and so forth. Another source of Another source of fluorescent protein. Now from not from a jellyfish, but from coral. This was from. These are the red fluorescent proteins. Take them. Yes, red was the first one, and then you have the MRFT and so on and so forth. So Roger Sien did this, and here now you have the palette of different colors of fluorescent proteins that you can use so, to look at things in different ways. And so as uh, someone has painted with the different fluorescent proteins and so. So I'll finish about the GFP part here. Yeah. Just one more. Lattice on the way to the cell surface are often packaged into tubular transport vesicles of significant size. Such tubular vesicles can branch and fragment before they fuse with the plasma membrane. The transport vesicles move along microtubules. which are stained here with a red fluorescent dye. The green cell in the corner does not contain fluorescent microtubules. So now we in the final 15 minutes or so We talk about this. We said we have solved one problem where we can look at proteins doing their thing in living cells. Another problem we said was that the resolution. Resolution is only about 200 nanometers. Individual proteins are nanometers in size, right? So then, how do we push the resolution of light microscopy to be in the order of, if not electron microscopy, but getting close to that? So these are the so-called super-resolution techniques, and the objective is again to beat this diffraction limit of light, 0.61 lambda by n sin x sin alpha. So we want to do better than this, better than this 200-500 nanometer diffraction limit, which people have thought was inviolate. And so, and then here we said the electron microscope has the most resolution, and these are. Standard confocal microscopy, wide field microscopy, and then these are the super resolution techniques, and that's what we want to look at. Just to have a sense of scale, these are say a mouse is about in the order of centimeters. The mouse is bigger than this about a centimeter. Um, a bacterium is about a micron, a virus hundred nanometers. Individual proteins are in the order of ten nanometers, and small molecules in the order of nanometers. So, so, and we want to. This we can see with our naked eye. This we can see with our naked eye. This we can see with our light microscope. Now we want to be able to see smaller and smaller things. Resolve more. Look at smaller length scales. So, 24 k Nobel Prize. Very good. Six k from Hill. William Morris. Two separate principles are involved. One enables the method of stimulated emission. Stay. They were the first Stefan Hill and the other Eric Bethsik and William Moller working separately in the foundation of the second method. Single molecule microscopy relies on the possibility to turn the fluorescence of individual molecules on and off. So, 
Uh, so let's look at the first one, state. What is state? State is stimulated emission depletion. And so just hearing the name, we don't know what that means. What does stimulated emission mean? Stimulated emission is a process by which an incoming photon of a specific frequency can cause, cause the emission of a photon of the same wavelength. Basically, the deal is this. And so say this is your 200 nanometer diffraction limited excitation spot, right? Now, you come in with a radar, another laser with a radar wave. Okay. And then, which, which is the shape of a donut, it has a hole in the middle. And, so, and what this red laser is doing, is it is silencing the blue laser. And so, when it, the effects of the blue laser. What, the, what does silencing mean? I mean? It basically means that any fluorophore which is here in this region of the diffraction limited spot, it will effectively not be, it will be excited but it will emit in a different wavelength effective. So effectively your, your volume that you are imaging in then is reduced. Say if this is your 200 nanometers uh, spot size, every fluorophore in this region, in the red region has been silenced. So effectively only the molecules in this very small volume are being excited and this is the order of this spot is in the order of 10, so 30 nanometers, 40 nanometers, something like that. The more and more you increase the power of the red laser, the smaller and smaller you can make this spot, effectively increasing your resolution. So this is a bit uh, complex. Like, huh? Most complex. Complex, but let us try to understand this. Okay, we are this, we are not stupid people. We will be able to understand this. So, so this we said that this say the excitation of GFP was 4AK nanometer, emission was shall we say 510 nanometer. So, and now this is your depletion beam which is about 600, 580 nanometers or so. What that depletion beam is doing is that say let's just look at the one photon excitation. The electrons are going to this excited state. When they are coming down from this state to the ground state, they, that's fluorescence, right? This we define here. This we understand. This is fluorescence. Now, what you can do is that if you have a greater photon than this, the 518 nanometer photon, you can force anything that has gone up to the excited state to come down to the ground state and emit a photon of the same wavelength as that depletion beam, as the silencing beam, as the trade lesson, which is 518 nanometer, which critically is beyond, this is your detection for GFP, and your depletion beam is just beyond that, it's just a bit greater than that, right? So then effectively what you are doing is that by by using this red laser, you are reducing the size of your confocal spot. The, you said, you said the resolution is limited by how tight a spot you can make. So now, by increasing the power of this red laser, you can make the central hole smaller and smaller and smaller, right? And that is the stimulated emission depletion. So, uh, But it requires a lot of red photons when it, for, for them for it to kick back. Whatever gets to the excited state in this zone will be kicked back to the ground state immediately and we may emit a red photon of the same wavelength as this one. Which is not critically, it's not green, it's a red photon, right? So what you are detecting, what you are trying to detect is the GFP, which is the green photon. And so there is, this is an orange red 518 nanometer photon. So, so what one has to appreciate, and this one will be able to appreciate, is that as I am increasing the power of this red laser, the central hole is becoming smaller and smaller, right? And this central hole, now this this whole thing is my diffraction limited spot. This is this has a radius of 200 nanometers. But this central hole is much, much smaller than that, right? By increasing the power of the red laser, then we can make the effective volume we are, where we are exciting the GFP is smaller and smaller and smaller and that's the principle of step. So and, so and then of course you need a lot of, look at the powers, milliwatt, 
depletion for megawatts per centimeter square. Right? That's a thousand times higher than what we would use for normal microscopy. Right? So, and then in both cases, we can say lambda by 2n was my resolution. Now there will be a term added to this, root over 1 plus i by is. Is is the intensity at which silencing happens, at which there is no fluorescence. When the depletion, the power of the laser goes beyond this point, you can see effectively there is no fluorescence, right? This is the fluorescence that I'm plotting on the y-axis. That has been reduced to zero, right? So now the further and further out you go, the greater is I with respect to this intensity for silencing, the the final and final will be your resolution. That's what is called the right here. So, uh, yeah, this records a lot of red photons. But the, the point is this, that you, here you have two beams then. This is your excitation beam and this is your depletion beam. So, and so here then effectively you will excite GFP only in that little hole there. And you can change the size of that hole to below diffraction. So, and that is the innovation here. And so, and as you increase the power more and more, that depletion is spontaneous. Zone where spontaneous emission happens. Spontaneous emission is the emission of the GFP. The stimulated emission, laser, we know the full form of laser, you know the full form of laser, what is the light amplification? Stimulated emission of radiation, right? Light amplification by stimulated em em emission of radiation. They also use a photon of a certain wavelength to put, kick some electron dots and get two photons from one photon into two photons of the, that wavelength. That's stimulated emission. This is spontaneous emission. This is the sign where your GFP emission is happening. So, and so thus your spot size instead of being this has now become this. So if you are imaging a mitochondria, this is what you would see with a standard quantum microscope. And this is what you can now see the inner crest of the mitochondria very nicely in a stable microscope. Uh, improvement. This is also a conventional microscope. This is a step microscope in terms of microtubules. That's a tubule in print, black tube in red, yellow in blue. Let's talk a bit too much about that. And then there's the other method called palm and storm. Here, see, look, we said that the size of this individual point molecule is about 300 nanometer, 200 nanometer, something of that order, right? But if we need to fit a Gaussian profile to this, we can localize the center of the spot to, many, uh, to much greater accuracy than that, right? So the size of this whole spot is about 300 nanometers, right? So it is like this. Here, this is, a, say, uh, the peak of a mountain. So it is true that this is 200 nanometers, shall we say, but where is it peaking? We should be able to identify that by fitting a two-dimensional Gaussian to this. Okay. So, and that we should be able to do with a precision much greater than this 200 nanometer precision for the peak, right? This, so you see that there is an intensity going up, up its maximum here, going down and going further down here. This is along x-axis, that's along y-axis. So if you fit a two-dimensional Gaussian to this, what, a bell-shaped curve, right? two-dimensional relationship to talk to this, you will get something like this. And this peak, you can, you can localize to much greater, uh, greater precision. So that's why you have single molecules. In real systems, it's difficult to excite just single molecules. And the innovation was that, that he, both in palm and storm, storms, stochastic optical reconstruction microscopy, uh, uh, is that you periodically, you turn on some molecules, image them, turn on some molecules, image them, and then localize them and, and thus build an image. So if you have a single molecule, it's no problem, you can localize it. If you have multiple dyes, it's difficult. You cannot, the Gaussian for this will mix with the Gaussian for this, will mix with the Gaussian for this, will mix with the Gaussian for this. You cannot really localize them individually. But what if you could, turn them on one by one, or a few at a time. So you'd say turn those guys on, the other guys are off. So then you'll be able to localize this one, this one, this one. You're going to have three spots in your image. Then you turn on this one, this one, this one, randomly. And then you'll have three more spots. And, so, and thus you can build an image. And so that's the basic principle of both 
calm and strong, so called in these two methods. And the more the photons you get, the better becomes your localization accuracy, right? So if you have one photon, you really don't know where the center is. If you have 10 photons, you begin to know. 100 photons, you will know. 1,000 photons, you exactly know where the center is, right? So then here, the, again, lambda by 2n was your regular resolution. Now this will be improved by root over the number of photons that we have. So, uh, so this we said that we will one by one randomly turn on molecules, image them, and then see this. this uh, and you get pretty images and so also with palm, which is use photo switchable GFP there instead of inorganic dyes. But uh, maybe this is easier to appreciate if we can if we can actually see this and uh, work. Um, hold this thing. This has become much. Wait. Bear with me for a second. So here on the on the left here are some images of tubulin, right? What it would be for a regular white field microscope, right? So here now you are using this method of photo switching. Right? And so uh, I can hold the mic and it's at the same time. So I'm sharp. No, I'm sharp. So look what we will do. We will activate some of the molecules, right? Once we activate the molecules, we can localize them, right? If we, they are the distinct molecules, we can localize them. Activating them with what? Activating them with a different wavelength of light. So we, what we do is that we would put them in something called chiral, which will turn them into a dark state, and then when you shine UV light on it, uh, it will some of the molecules will be activated. Not all of them, some of them will be activated. And because some of them will be activated, we can fit, uh, we can read out the fluorescence from that. We are activating them with UV, then looking at fluorescence again, shall we say, silent in infrared. And then once we read them out, we can get the positions of each of them out. So once we get the positions of each of them out, we will put some dots in our image, right? We put some dots. Now we will do this again and read out and localize and again and read out and localize 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 and read out and localize. You do it a few number of times, right? At the end, what are you seeing? What what are you seeing here? What are you seeing here when 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 you have read out all these positions? You are seeing this was your original image, right, of the microtubules. Now you can see the individual strands of the microtubules with their their 20, 25 nanometer thick. In this method, they come out about 14 nanometers or so. But the point is that you are just localizing each individual molecule, and so and by Doing this repeatedly, I did this repeatedly, I could get the points of each individual molecule that is emitting out. And from that I got this image, right? And this image, tell me, that image does look better than this, right? It looks sharper than that. But I had to do it several times. I, I activated, I read out, I localized, I activated, I read out, I localized, I activated, I read out, I localized. But ultimately what I got was a very sharp image of a Microtubule, which would not have been, which would have looked like this otherwise on my computer microscope. So then, but this because this is just limited by how well you can localize individual molecules. You can push the resolution down even to 10 nanometers or so now with this uh, technique, right? Yeah. So. Palm is also a similar technique, just uses photo switchable uh, GFP. So this uh, sci-fi is usually used in uh, this storm method of storm, and this is so I say Aldi Ishtani in our institute is uses this storm method very well, and these are images actually originally taken by him, where you can look look at. Uh, 
proteins, uh, the presynaptic side and postsynaptic side of a neuronal synapse circuit. So let's not worry about too much about this, but let's look at this carefully. So on the top in blue, you see microtubules, which you know by this time you know what microtubules are. They, they are the railroad tracks of the cell in a white field microscope. And in, in A, then in C and E, you have zoomed in portions of that. Okay? So, and in B, D and F, you have the storm, corresponding storm images. So at, between A and P, you really don't see that much of a difference, right? But once you start zooming in, look at the difference between this one and this one, and this one and this one, right? So really, we are getting much, much sharper images than was possi previously possible with regular confocal fluorescence microscopy. Right? And so, and that this is done again by localizing individual molecules on this microtubule tract. So. Here then we compare two methods, TED, and you can get the same protein, GP200. This is what it would look like in your regular fluorescence microscope. Not very nice, right? Not very nice. But these are your, now your state images where you can see the eight monomers which make the nuclear core complex. This is a picture of the nuclear core complex. This is with state, this is with storm. You can see one, two, three, eight, sort of. Flip this image around, but you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Exactly what people had predicted with biochemistry, what people had thought about the nuclear core complexes. We can now see it with microscopy. And previously, this was only possible. This is the electron microscopy image. Right? This is almost like it's getting to be as good as the electron microscopy image, both with stack and with storm. And so, how far can we push the resolution? So again, we said that this is the absence of anything, lambda by 2 n is the diffraction limited resolution of your light microscope. With the super resolution techniques, this will be modified by a factor of s, and that factor of s will be root over n for storm, palm kind of techniques, and root over 1 plus i by is, is being the intensity required to silence the flow of force for state. So with both techniques then, you can, here you can push the, people have pushed the resolution down to 5 nanometers. That, after that actually it's difficult because the, even if, because of thermal noise you will have jiggling in your matter. And, so, and, and with stent, they have pushed it down to 20 nanometers or so. So many, at least an order of magnitude better than what we are doing with conventional light microscopy. And find, I've taken the final two slides from Shudipto, where, where this is, this is uh, drawn from transmission electron microscopy images. So we are still not there. You can see this is the this is a macrophage eating a bacterium. Let me give you some perspective. This is the nucleus of the macrophage. This is the nuclear core complex. This is the plasma membrane of the macrophage. This is the cell wall of the bacteria. You can see a flagellum here. Right? And all this is this is made from electron microscopy images. So light microscopy is still not quite there, but that's where we hope to go. So yeah. And so this is so still one more order of magnitude to get to get to the detail of this picture. So but we will get there again the people are nearly there. So we are not down to the resolution of an electron microscope still, maybe, but still we are very close. So we have solved the problem of resolution, we have solved the problem of uh, looking at dynamics and medium cells. So, and these are the two, the 2008 and 2014 enterprises in chemistry. So, so that's what I had to say to you today. Today, so what did we, to recap, we know, we learned of the diffraction limit of light microscopy. We learned about fluorescence, which you can use to look at structures inside cells. But just static structures, that's not very satisfying. So we use GFP technology to look at dynamics in living cells. And finally, we, with state and storm, we tried to push the limits of light microscopy down to nanometer to tens of nanometer resolution. And this is what is, has recently been very exciting and has been exciting in many people. And with that, I kept you a little bit late, sorry about that, but thank you for your attention. Thank you.